The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission visits communities across Canada to answer questions about how it regulates the nuclear industry, protecting the health, safety and security of Canadians and the environment. One of the ways we do this is through an information session called CNSC 101. This is the second of five videos produced from this CNSC 101 information session. It explains the laws and regulations the CNSC uses to regulate the nuclear industry. So that's basically what we have. We have the Act, the Nuclear Safety Control Act at the top. And then we have the regulation, a large set of regulation that Colin will go through later on, and myself. And then we have licenses, certificate, license conditions, and order. Those are not regulation per se. But licenses are binding on the licensees. For instance, our friends from Chemico have a license. They're bound by their license, and they have to comply with their license. Any licensee with one of our license who does not comply with the condition of their license can face orders, and up to including being charged for an offense under our legislation. With the new legislation, this year we've got power to have administrative monetary penalties. It's basically, we're going to be able to give ticket to licensees who are in contravention. It's not yet enforced in the sense we haven't yet started. We have to produce regulations, but it's coming to a theater near you. Licensees are not that happy about it, but it's under the old system, like for instance, Mahmoud Yadigari, we had to charge him in a criminal code-like fashion under our legislation. It's costly not timely, huge resources, and it, it takes time. And judges often don't appreciate the nature of the offenses. So with administrative monetary penalties, it will be easier to manage compliance. And then we have regulatory documents. We have policy paper, information documents. We have regulatory documents we call RD. And those, uh, Colin, will go into more detail. So that's basically our, our regulatory framework. I like the slide with the thing that slides. It's kind of nice. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> guidance. We have guidance document. I always say guides for the fool. No, guides for the wise, rule for the fool. Guidance document. If you don't comply with the guidance, then there's a chance we're going to inspect you. There's a chance you're not going to pass inspection. There's a chance you're going to get an order or been dragged in front of the commission to explain why you're not complying. So basically, the legislation, as I started, we went through definition, purpose, 4 to 7, the application of the act, including exemption, and then 8. We went through this. Section 8. Now, you'll have to take your legislation in your hands, because I don't think we covered each of them in the slides. Uh, can you just check if further slides cover each of the sections? Because I don't think so. 8. Is the establishment of the commission. Basically, uh, what I explained, we're an agent of Her Majesty the Queen. That was very important, because for Aboriginal consultation, when I was with the Department of Justice until 2008, the position of justice was that we did not have the power to conduct duty to consult with Aboriginal people. We were told that we are not an agent of the Crown for that purpose. So I, even with justice, I said, I disagree. If you look at 8 subsection 2, it says clearly, for all its purpose, we're an agent of Her Majesty the Queen. We may exercise power only as an agent of Her Majesty. So it took a case of judicial review against us by the so-called Athabasca Regional Government, which is a group of Aboriginal people in Saskatchewan that pretend to be a government of their own and that want to assert their independence vis-a-vis -vis other communities in the government. They took us to court on the renewal of a McLean Lake in Saskatchewan mine. And we went to court and we won. But the big argument was they were arguing that we did not have the authority to carry on the duty to consult. And so we used this case to spearhead the theory we had that we were. And we won at the first level. And they took us to a field court. 
And we also won in the Court of Appeal. After that, the Department of Justice and the Department of uh, Indian and Northern Affairs had to accept that we could conduct our own duty to consult. For people who don't know, under Section 35 of the Constitution, as an agent of government, before we make a decision that may impact claims, land claims, or treaties, we have to abundantly consult with Aboriginal people to find out if a project or a decision will affect the exercise of their right. And if you don't do it, or you do it poorly, then they can take you to court and quash your decision. It's very, very important in Canadian law and in our work that we understand land claim and treaties, that we consult, consult in a meaningful way. So there's a couple of cases that are interesting on this. It's uh, the one that uh, is quoted most often is called Aida, and the other one is Taku. Those two cases basically laid down the rules as far as duty to consult is concerned. There's been a number of other cases like Misikyu, uh, Standing Buffalo. Uh, there's a whole, whole large, large amount of jurisprudence on Aboriginal consultation. I have one lawyer that, that is dedicated to Aboriginal law in my legal service. All my lawyers have to be quite familiar with Aboriginal consultation. It's a must.